Hey, Noggin Notes listeners, you are in for a treat. I'm Jake Wiskirchen, the host. If this is your first time joining, uh, get used to my voice because I'm also the interviewer. But this week kicks off a three-part series on black mental wellness. Our founder, Safiso Rapinga, is a black man from South Africa. And it was his idea, and I highly support it, obviously, to reach into the people of color community within our mental health profession and get them on the show to talk about you know, civil unrest, uh, discrimination, um, stigma, barriers to care, and so forth. Come to find out, there aren't too many. Uh, but he did find a wonderful lady by the name of Danielle Busby, who is a co-founder of a group called Black Mental Wellness. And you can go to blackmentalwellness.com and check them out. But she's a, she's a PhD holder and an associate professor in the Baylor College of Medicine in Texas, originally from Michigan. And I really learned a lot listening to her. In the subsequent parts of this series, we're going to interview a couple more people who have different perspectives on this topic. I found it fascinating and um, not at all as hyperbolic as maybe we're led to believe on social media. So I invite you guys to settle in and listen because uh, we can all learn something by having more conversations about difficult topics. And really, that's what podcasts are supposed to do. We're supposed to have long form content that delves into the nuance and we're not just stuck to six minute video clips in between ads or uh, 30 second talking head sound bites or uh, 280 characters at a time to express our, our thoughts and our views. We, we should do more depth analysis and exchange of ideas in a, a much more informal, relaxed and flowing manner. So we're just going to try to contribute our part to that. And in the meantime, if you want to learn more about this kind of stuff, you can go check out Audible. We are sponsored by Audible. And if you want a free 30-day trial, you can go to audibletrial.com slash and sign up. You get to get a free audio downbook, uh, download. You can either be a book or any one of their unmatched uh, pieces of content in their library. And even if you cancel, you get to keep your audio download. So audibletrial.com slash noggin notes, uh, lots and lots and lots of stuff to cover there that will continue to enrich and expand your noggin, which is what we're trying to do with noggin notes. We're also sponsored by Zephyr Wellness, a company that I co-own in Reno, Nevada and in Sparks, Nevada. Reno and Sparks are sister cities. If you've never visited, you totally should. Uh, come on out and enjoy what Northern Nevada has to offer. Four seasons, uh, friendly people, very close to Lake Tahoe. ZephyrWellness.org is where you can find out more about us or follow us on any of our social media pages, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Without further delay, here's my interview with Daniel Busby. I think you will enjoy it. Well, thanks again for downloading our content, everybody. Uh, today with me is Dr. Daniel Busby. Hello, Daniel. Hello. Thank you for having me today. Did I pronounce the S appropriately with, with a Z instead of an S or is it Busby? No, it has the Z sound. You had it right. Okay, but, good. Mm-hmm. I always worry about things yeah, like that. Yeah, with a name like Wiskirchen, you tend to respect other people's uh, pronunciations. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are, and I'll let you do your, your uh, verbal resume. Everybody likes verbal resumes when they introduce, but um, you currently serve as a, an associate professor uh, within the School of Medicine at Baylor University in Houston, Texas, uh, but at a children's hospital doing psychological stuff. So um, that's kind of the brief overview, but tell us, tell everybody else what it is that you do and why you do it, and uh, we'll yeah. get the interview underway. Absolutely. Um, so I am, like you said, I'm an assistant professor at Baylor College of Medicine slash Texas Children's Hospital. Um, there, I primarily do work around trauma and grief, as well as depressive symptoms and suicidal risk among adolescents. Um, I've been there for almost a year now, where previously I was at the University of Michigan in the Department of Psychiatry there. Um, And my work there was really centered around barriers to care, particularly among um, Black college students who are at elevated risk for suicide. So this kind of makes up, uh, you know, the range of my areas of interest. I'm really interested in like this traumatic stress piece of things. So that could be trauma, but also experiences racial discrimination. I'm also really interested in what protects against that. So like what entities in the community and your family in the world, how do we cope with that? How do we make it better? And then the system piece of it, like utilization of treatment services. So what gets in the way, what facilitates. 
So I do this work because I'm passionate about it. Uh, I think it's necessary. Um, and, you know, my work with Black Mental Wellness as a, a co-founder there is largely because I really saw such a lack of resources, uh, understandable information, um, just like a, a hub for where people could go for information within the Black community specifically. Yeah, let's hover there for a second, because I want you to talk about that. Um, our founder, Safiso, who, who is bl a black man from South Africa, um, had this idea that we should do a series on people of color in the mental health world, because uh, they're few and far between, frankly. Um, and we need to give, we need to shed light and give voice, uh, because there are a lot of people who need services and, and often like either are afraid or don't have access or just are ignorant of what's out there. So, um, help maybe helpful listening audience who I can presume is broadly white or non, non colored, um, understand like what the dynamics are and how they're different for people of color in seeking mental health treatment and how you guys came together as a group to form black mental wellness. Right. Okay. I'm going to start with this Lo loaded part. question. I know. <laughs> no, it's cool. I'm going to start with the second part of your question first, because I think it's going to help answer that first part. Um, so we are a team of four clinical psychologists. All of us are black women um, who have PhDs in clinical psychology and how we came together. So Nicole Kamek, Dr. Nicole Kamek, she's our president and CEO. And she had this idea prior to our starting, maybe a year or so prior, where she was becoming frustrated with um, needing certain resources. She was working in a VA, needing certain resources for her black patient population to help them better understand aspects of depression or help them better understand aspects of how it may present for them, which sometimes will look differently from what we would consider to be the typical presentation, right? And so in this, she kind of developed the idea. She got the website together, like identified the name and, and thought a lot about that. And then she really started to think about who she thought would be you know, the best people to kind of create this team with her. And Nicole and um, Jessica Henry and myself, we all went to George Washington University um, and we all had the same academic advisor. However, we were in the program at different times. So Nicole had finished first. Jess was probably, the, like she's in the middle. And then I was um, an entering student. Jess was probably in her like third year when I entered as a first year. And Nicole was nearly done. And so she knew we had the same passion just because when you hold that same advisor, you have a similar interest. And I really, we just happened to be talking one day and I was just telling her that I thought that I was gonna do something very similar to Black Mental Wellness by myself which in reality, I'm like, that's crazy. I can't imagine how that would look. I'm so happy to have a team. Um, and really, we just got tired of feeling like there wasn't um, adequate resources, adequate, adequate information, and that there was such a stigma around mental health in the Black community. For myself, I used to feel like um, a lot of times, by the times I would see my patients, if they, if they identified as Black, it was way later in their, their symptom presentation, right? They were far more severe. When they could have came in far earlier, we could have had a better prognosis or, you know, just a, a, a easier course of treatment. Um, and, and that bothered me. And when I went to the data and it showed that that was like, a, a, like several studies have found this, that was concerning. So that's when I really had these questions around, like, how do we change the system like if we have this model of meeting people where they are how do we change the systems that we're working in to really meet the needs of the black community in a way that they can understand it that they can receive it and and, and it feels relatable and and comfortable right and i mean just given the historical context of how the healthcare system has been in this country there's been instances of such mistrust already built between the black community, I mean, if we're talking like Tuskegee experiment, if we go back there or whatever, all the different things that have happened that have brought us to this day. And we just were like, we have to respond to that. We have to have something to do in, in shifting that narrative. So uh, just to be clear, when you say if she worked for the VA, was that uh, Veterans Administration or Virginia? Yeah, a VA okay. hospital. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's going to be super useful for me. Uh, I'm going to talk to you offline about that because I've, I'm doing work with the VA here uh, and then uh, federally a little bit. So if we can combine forces, I think it'd be great. Um, I want to hover on that that topic of like lacking resources, lacking access, uh, mistrust. If you could give some like crystallized, for instances, uh, I would I personally would appreciate it because I think I may have a gist of what you're you're referring to, but like what is it like? being a black person in America 
who, you know, struggles psychologically. Uh, and then what, what's the barrier there? Like how, how is it different, I guess, from anybody else? Cause we always talk about mental health being stigmatized broadly. How's it different, I guess? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to start the first place I'm going to start. Um, it's just like from, I'll, I'll even reference some of my research. So in looking at black college students who were presenting as elevated risk for suicide, um, in a, in a study, we, and when looking at the black college students, particularly the primary barrier to care was perceived need, right? So they, it was a limited perceived need. Like I actually am presenting just like everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. at, at elevated risk, but I'm perceiving that I don't need to seek services, even though I'm having symptoms that are consistent with what we would consider to be elevated for suicide risk, right? And part of that, I think, if you just look at the history of Black people in this country, or like Black Americans, or, or Black people, um, you know, across the world, really, like, if you think about instances of like that historical context of where you've come from, at least if I'm going to talk from the U.S. perspective, um, you know, we've overcome a lot of things. We've overcome slave, we, like our, our ancestors have overcome slavery. We've had to make it through um, like the Jim Crow era of our, of our history and so on. And then, I mean, if we want to bring it to present day, I mean, there's been increased attention as it relates to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. I mean, we can continue to go on as it relates to police brutality. That's not a new issue, right? Like that's something that we've been dealing with. So if you see right. people in your community constantly transcending or finding ways to transcend these difficulties sometimes it may feel like i shouldn't need this additional help because i'm supposed to be strong i'm supposed to come from a history of strength and overcoming and all these things right and so that narrative can be built to be like you um shouldn't need this additional help and then you definitely shouldn't need it from people that may or may not have your best interest at heart right and so when you say like, so I, that's my first point when we're trying to like crystallize it, right? Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So when you think about it being different, like everyone doesn't have that historical context in which they, they're growing in, right? To have this piece of like what you're supposed to overcome. Or even if you think about the black community and its relationship to the church, um, there may be a lot of uh, perceptions or indirect messages that say that like, you're not praying hard enough. You're not having enough faith. Um, that's why these problems exist. Like, or, or, I mean, I think the church has gotten so much more progressive in that you can go to therapy and you can pray and those things can be work or that, you know, God made clinicians, God made ways of treatment. Like, you know, and, and we've had more progressive conversations in that way, but that's not always the case. Sometimes it does feel like, you know, it's something internally wrong with the way you're engaging in your faith or, you know, you're not being patient enough for this blessing that may come, right? to solve some of these issues. And so I think those instances, and, and, and when we talk about mistrust, when, you, when you've when you learned, and sometimes it's not in the public school system, but if you've learned from your family, I know my father was really big on like in, in, educating me on just the his, history of black people globally, but particularly not only in the country, but in the city I grew up in. And, you know, you have knowledge of the range of ways in which we've been oppressed and we've, you know, like our, our health and our wellness hasn't been prior, prioritized in the same way. If you look at, it's um, Black Maternal uh, Health Week, right? And so if you look at maternity rates, right, of, of, of death, when, when we're talking about childbirth, right, there's, there's a study that talks about how when Black women express that they're having pain or they're having, um, you know, they need additional support or whatever, that they're not being perceived or taken as seriously. As, uh, as when you look across races, right? Because this idea, even, even if it's in, un, unconscious, it may be an implicit, like, you know, you're not intending to think, oh, you're really strong. You're, you're a strong oh. black woman. You're okay. And so even the experiences you have with healthcare providers, and then we have data to show we're seeing differences and we're having higher rates of, of people, uh, you know, of, of, of deaths for, for mothers, that's concerning. So you, you, you develop a sense of uncertainty about the system that is intended to take care of you about, is it really doing that? Uh, and I mean, we can think about that similarly with the police force, right? Like you're supposed to protect, but somehow this group of people keep ending up on the other side of things in a way that doesn't seem about protecting, mm -hmm. right? And so I think, I hope that answers, you know, generally like that idea of like, what is it like? Yeah, for sure. Uh, do, you, do you study much Carl Jung? at all or joseph campbell you know about archetypes yeah um so what it sounds like actually is like a modern archetype of 
the, the black individual, male or female, doesn't matter, is supposed to be strong. And whether you're of melanated skin 